a little on the short side this week. Um, for those of you who may not know, I'm Monty McIntyre, and I this is the last time of this is the last Lenten uh, series talk that we're doing together. You may recall in the beginning we did ministry. Everybody called to ministry. When we look, we narrowed it down to focused ministry. The next week we looked at grace. We couldn't do anything without the grace of God. And then we, we looked at baptism. That was another time. And then last week we looked at Lent, moving into Holy Week. Does anybody remember being here last week talking about Lent going into Holy Week? All right. Now, what I mentioned what I mentioned was that going from Lent into Holy Week, we're, and we're going to talk more about that today, when we're talking about Holy Week, when does it begin? The end of Lent. Today. Holy Week began today. What is today? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, the Sunday of the Passion. And so I want to just talk to you about a, a couple of things. One is, have you seen this calendar in Regis's office? Has anybody seen this calendar? Okay, now, this has a wealth of information. In some churches, when I was at Holy Cross, everybody got a calendar who wanted one. I might suggest that St. Brendan's thinks about that. So what it does is tell you the colors, the liturgical colors of the, of the Sundays and the days of the week. And so this being April, last week was the 7th, which was, you may recall, the 5th Sunday of Lent. The vestments were what color? Purple. Purple. All right. Now, today, and, and, and remain so all week, today, however, is Palm Sunday, and that's basically red. And you see, this is all week, except we're going to talk about Maundy Thursday, when the vestments, the liturgical color for that evening service is what color? White. White. We're going to talk about why that is. Now, you're going to be confused if you just look at this and you'll say, Monty, can't you see? Something wrong with them glasses? You ought to be seeing that that's red. But if you read the fine print, it says, Monday, Thursday, violet may be used at the offices, white. You read for me, Karen, please. <laughs> oh, white for mass. There you go. Okay, so the idea is when you come in here, if you come in here for Thursday, you're going to be seeing white vestments, I'm guessing. I ain't in charge, but that's what I'm guessing. <laughs> okay, so Holy Week, we're going to talk about Holy Week, and I'm going to do what I can um, knowing that we're a little rushed. Okay, let me just ask you, if you were here last week and you went through the service today, did anything we say, we said last week, make sense to you? Did you get the two moods of the day? All glory, laud, and honor, and then we're reading the Passion. Do you notice the mood drastically, dramatically changes? Okay, so we call, in the Western Church, we call this week Holy Week. The Eastern Church often calls it the Great Week. It's the same week. And these liturgies of this week are the most dramatic, the most solemn and the most significant liturgies we have in our entire liturgical year. This is the pinnacle week in terms of liturgy. And so it began today, and that's why you all have palms, bunches of palms everywhere. And um, when does Holy Week end? the end of the Easter Vigil. Holy Week is over at the end of the Easter Vigil. Now, the other word that's significant is the Triduum. Try three days, basically. The Easter Triduum. When is that? 
when does it start? It starts Thursday at the end of Lent. When does Lent end? Thursday at the beginning of the evening service. Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday, the Mass of the Lord's Supper. That's when Lent ends, and that's when the Triduum begins. Now, when does the Easter Triduum end? Okay, if I said to you, Even Song, would you look at me and go, huh? Or would you know what I'm talking about? So the church, and we could, we could have, but we didn't, uh, and we could at some other time, look at the offices, what we call the offices of the church. It's not like Regis's space over there. But it's like morning <coughs> prayer and even song. And so Holy Week, rather the Triduum, ends at Vespers or even song on Easter Sunday. So we're talking two related but different entities. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so Holy Week began today with the procession of the palms. It lasts until the great vigil of Easter following Saturday night. Um, so Holy Week is a weird duck. It spans both Lent, because we're still in Lent, and into Easter. So Holy Week is not an official unit of the liturgical year um, because it has most of the triduum and the wind up of Lent. But Holy Week is a very special week as you can just see from any church calendar the colors there. Okay, so Holy Week as you may remember from last week once Jesus died and rose, people expected him to come show back up in a big hurry. Do you remember that? They expected him coming back. And so every Sunday was a little Easter. Every Sunday is still a little Easter. They celebrated the resurrection of Jesus the Christ every Sunday. Well, it became pretty obvious that he ain't showing up real fast. And so they began to have an annual celebration and making it a big deal for the resurrection. When they did that, that meant that the Easter Vigil became a big deal. The whole Jewish setting was to anticipate the night before, like the Sabbath. When does the Sabbath begin? The Sabbath is Saturday, but it begins Friday at sunset. Does that make sense? So the Easter Vigil, the anticipation of this Easter celebration, started then. And so what happened was the earliest celebration, annual, not weekly, annual celebration was likely the Easter Vigil. That would have been the oldest of them all. Now, <clears throat> they worked backwards as we said last time for the passion, death, and resurrection. So then they built in these few days of Lent. We talked about that. And we see that they differ, developed in different times and different places over those early years. And so, again, the earliest annual liturgical celebration would have been the Easter Vigil. How many people are planning to show up at the Easter Vigil this year? Okay, so you will see, and we'll talk about that as well, something that has its origins as far back as at least the mid-second century. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so every other place, that would be in Rome, that would be in Jerusalem, wherever, they all would have their celebrations um, at various times, but the Holy Land is where they would have celebrated every Sunday the resurrection, but then made this Easter Vigil <coughs> celebration. Okay, so what about Holy Week? How, when did this come into existence? It was, as we said last week, it was a, initially a period of prayer and fasting in anticipation of this annual celebration, the Easter Vigil. And how do we know this? We know it from a, a manuscript called the Didache. Have you ever heard of the, it looks like Didache, but they say Didache. Have you ever heard of the Didache? Okay, so the Didache 
is also known as the teaching of the 12 apostles. In the very early days, they didn't discover this manuscript until 1883. And it changed the way everybody did everything. So once this didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles was, was discovered, they began to put a few things together. Next to the Bible, this manuscript was considered number one in importance. And you've never heard of it. But don't feel badly, neither has anybody else. Unless you go to school forever in theology school, like me. <laughs> So, both the Didache and the writings of Irenaeus of Lyon tell us what this vigil was like, what life was like back then. And so, um, people have done a lot of research on this since then, you can imagine. Um, so, it was divided into three parts, moral, disciplinary, and liturgical. And so, th it's the, the liturgical section that made the difference in terms of how now we celebrate the Easter Vigil. So one of the things it says in there is that instead of pouring water for baptism, people should be immersed when possible. That was what was noted in the Didache. We don't do that now, but whatever. The Eucharistic prayers, you can see those, are similar to ours. They're not identical. So. The Didache and the Apostles' teaching are the oldest extant, do you know that term, extant? Existing, remaining texts that we have. Now, by the third century, we have evidence for a week-long fast. And we talked about that pri prior to Easter. We, they were into a fast. And that, that took them you know, into the third century to figure out. Now, have you ever heard of Egeria? No. Okay. There's another one that's very interesting. The pilgrimage of Egeria. In the fourth century, a very rich woman made these pilgrimages and she went to New Testament sites and Old Testament sites. She visited all kinds of people. She must have had a lot of money and she must, she had belonged to some sisterhood of, of a group of devout women and she was reporting back to them. This document was not found this was found in 1883. This one wasn't discovered until 1884 in an 11th century manuscript. So what Egeria did was go around and talk about how Holy Week was celebrated in various places. And so we now have a whole map of how we do business. Um, so, she talked about ceremonies in Jerusalem, she talked about Epiphany, Holy Week, Easter, and Pentecost. She went to all kinds of sites, she visited Egypt, Syria, and Constantinople. We don't know much more than what we can see in that text, except she knew the Bible well, she was um, uh, very devout, and, and the people that she hung around with cared about her experiences. And so you say to yourself, well, how do we know that's true? The early other extant texts support what Egeria has said. And so the text itself is called the, the Pilgrimage of Egeria, and again goes back to the fourth century. So if you show up, like today you were here, and if you show up on Holy Monday Thursday, and if you show up on at the Easter Vigil, you will be doing the same things, basically, that people have been doing since before the fourth century. Now that's pretty amazing to think about. So you say to yourself, well, you know, how come they didn't used to do it like that? They didn't used to know. It didn't used to come into to the church um, liturgy. It's, I, I thought that was new, all this Easter Vigil. No, it's not new. It is the most ancient stuff. Now, let, so today is Palm Sunday. You know all about Palm Sunday. Now, Holy Week has Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay, so I, in, I'm telling you, this is a very valuable manuscript, I mean, uh, document. And so on the front, you have the color stuff. Very nice. 
on the back of every month, it tells you the readings. And so if you have one of these and you choose to do your own devotions, you can see that on Monday of Holy Week, all the readings are prescribed. Tuesday, when, they don't do that for every, you know, on the 4th of July, it's probably not gonna be so obvious. But this week, every day is specified. Now, if I said to you, the servant songs of Isaiah, would you know what I'm talking about? Okay, who was Isaiah? He was a prophet, one of the major, we got major prophets and minor prophets, he was a major prophet. And he um, wrote, actually there were three Isaiahs, there's Isaiah, then there was Deutero-Isaiah, meaning the second Isaiah, then there was Trito-Isaiah, meaning the third. And so there's 66 chapters and they get divided up, 1 to 36 and all that. So if you were to look at Isaiah 42, 1 to 9, you make sure I'm not making this up here, you would see um, one of the, the servant songs. And on Monday, it's the first servant song. So, what does that mean? That means we use the words of that we now in, with our post-resurrection awareness. We look back at those words from Isaiah and we say, that refers to Jesus. Boom, like that. And so, if we can, if we can see, um, let me just, I'll just do the Isaiah 42, and they specify the verses 1 to 9. See if this sounds familiar. It should sound familiar. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the name. Who does it sound like? Sounds like Jesus, right? So what we have done is look at the words of Isaiah and apply them to Jesus. We, Christians, with post-resurrection awareness. Does that make sense? Did Isaiah have Jesus in mind? No. Just like you love your grandkids, but you didn't know they were going to show up when you were 16, right? <laughs> okay, he will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street or a, bru a bruised reed. He will not break. Do you remember hearing that image? Okay, whatever. So there are three servant songs, there are four. The first one is used on part of the readings on Monday, the second on Tuesday, the third on Wednesday. And the fourth, the last one, is on Good Friday. Okay, so, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of Holy Week, there are no prescribed, the prayer book does not have anything for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Holy Week. Now, let's move in, but the readings are special, they're not random. And they're also, it's every single gospel in those first three days is from John. John, the last written, the most theologized, the gospel that tells us most about what the meaning of Jesus is. Okay, if you have your prayer book there and can find page 274, page 274. Okay, now, the other thing I want to mention is that every day during Holy Week has its own collect. Remember we talked about that opening prayer that collects the thoughts and prayers of the people. Everyone has its own every day. So if you don't take your finger out of that page, but look at pages 220 and 221, you'll see Monday in Holy Week has its own collect. Tuesday in Holy Week, Wednesday, then we look at Monday, Thursday. Do you see that on page 220 and 221? Okay, let's go back now to Monday, Thursday. Again, what color are the vestments? There should be only one service on Monday, Thursday, even if you're big like Calvary or some other place, only one service on Monday, Thursday. And they're what color? White. They're white. Even though you look there and you see a red. White for the, the service. If they're going to do the office, if they're going to do a, a morning prayer, they, they'll be in red. But if it's 
uh, the only Eucharist is Maundy Thursday. Okay, where does that word Maundy come from? The mandatum, the command. From John 13, do you remember part of the service is the washing of the feet? Do you recall that? Okay, and what does Jesus say during that time? I give you a new commandment that you, help me now, love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. So that's where the term mondi, mandatum, command, this is, uh, I give you a new commandment. You got the big ten? Put this one in there. This is the big one. Okay, so this feast, like you can imagine all the others in Holy Week, has a huge, huge history, complicated history, long history, how it's been. Now, so in very early days, you had the bishop. And so whatever the bishop said went. And the bishop presided over all the services. As the group got bigger and bigger and bigger, could you be everywhere, Megan? <laughs> no. So you needed some helpers. They were called presbyters. Give me another word for presbyter. Priest. So priests were deputized to represent the bishop. And so that's what happens even today in our dioceses. The bishop is the primary celebrant. And when you look at any place page 355 and on, you will see the bishop, or if he's not or she's not available, it, the priest will stand and say. Have you noticed that? That's because the ordinary, and the bishop is called the ordinary of the diocese. So when the bishop is there, you preside. When Dorsey comes, who presides? Dorsey does, because he is the ordinary. But Regis is deputized to do business here in Franklin Park. Okay, so when the church began to get so big that the bishop couldn't be everywhere, these priests had to be deputized. So there's three things going on on Maundy Thursday. One is when the bishop would confirm somebody, do you remember back in the old days, the bishop put some chrism known as oil? That has to be blessed, and only the bishop can bless the chrism. That's one kind of oil. Another kind of oil is the oil of the catechumens, people on their way like Job to be baptized. If there's any anointing going on, that's the oil of catechumen. Any of these priests can bless that, but they don't anymore. It's always the bishop. So, and then there's the oil of the sick. Has anybody ever been anointed or know someone who's been anointed with oil? Yeah, okay. So. Three different kinds of oil, but the chrism is something special to the bishop. So, when it became a big deal, the bishop couldn't be everywhere, she would deputize the priests. And y'all would be there having to get your oil blessed by the bishop. And so what would happen is, all the, the priests here would come to where the bishop is and she would bless the oil. Do you see that? And then you take it out. This still happens. It will happen this week. It happens every week when the priests meet together at the cathedral at whatever day during the week. But that was always a part of the Maundy Thursday celebration. We have taken it out for practical purposes. The priests have to be in their own parish. They can't be hanging out at the cathedral and here at the same time. Does that make sense? Okay, but that's a big function of Maundy Thursday. Okay, what we know as Maundy Thursday is the Mass of the Lord's Supper. And so that starts, I don't know what time it is here, you probably do, probably around seven o'clock or something like that. And so that is the opening of the sacred triduum. And so, again, white vestments. It is to be celebrated in the evening with as many people as possible. If you can make it, that's the idea, that you show up. Uh, and no other masses, no other Eucharist will be available during that day. Now, the celebration, like you saw today, has a mixed character. In order to understand 
what it is. We need to understand that the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus is a unit. They are not, we're not today separate looking at those as discrete events. We see that all as a, as a unit. And so, on the one hand, you'll have on Maundy Thursday a festal opening and there'll be a Gloria. I mean, I don't know what you're doing here, but most churches, there will be a Gloria. What is Gloria? Have you had a Gloria all Lent? No, teammates. In place of the Gloria, what have you done? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Maybe you did the Trisagion. Holy God, holy immortal one. Do you remember any of that? Okay, so the Gloria has been gone all Lent. It comes back on Maundy Thursday. But only the Gloria. What's the, the, the big deal on Easter Vigil? Parallel. Alleluia. Well, that, but also the Exultet. Did you ever hear of the Exultet? It's a big, long Gloria. But this is a muted, mitigated service on Maundy Thursday. But it's got that festal character. So it opens with this, um, this positive um, celebratory feel to it. Now, um, so, let me see where I am here. You can, but you don't want to, focus only on the institution of the Eucharist because that's what churches sometimes do. But that's, you don't want to focus on discrete events. It's the whole package deal. Passion, death, resurrection of Jesus the Christ. So, um, so what's going to happen? So you have this festal service with a Gloria, not the great exultet of the, of the Easter Vigil. And then, after the Gospel, you'll have the institution story of the Eucharist as part, as the, the, the second reading, as, as the Corinthian, from the Corinthians. And then, you'll have the President of the Assembly, Regis will wash people's feet, I guess. Are you doing that here? Yes. You're not sure. Yes. You're doing hands. All right. But you get the idea what that, I mean, Jesus, we don't have dusty roads anymore and people wear shoes, right? They get the sandals. And, and women with their hose. Oh my God. Let me tell you from experience. Yeah. So hands makes a lot of practical sense. Okay. So, so basically what we have is two acted out stories or parables. The one is the washing of the feet. Are you confused? You all right? Yeah. Um, all right. So one is the acting out of the, the washing of the feet, or in your case, the hands. And the other one is the institution of the Eucharist, exactly what the Eucharist was about. Okay, so what is the point? The point of those two acted out parables is to ritually and symbolically express the fact that life, real, true, honest life, is to be found in self-serving, rather self-sacrificing service. That's the point. We look at Jesus and we see someone who gave himself for others. That's the point of the Eucharist and the, um, the washing of the feet. Okay, so the, the first reading is the narrative of the Passover meal. And so that situates this experience in the context of the passing from slavery to freedom of the, of the um, Israelites, the Moses experience moving, the Passover. And so this liberation from slavery is what we're about on Maundy Thursday night. Okay, now, how does this service conclude, unlike any other? How does it conclude? How does it end? Oh, how does it end? At the end of the service, the elements are taken probably to your side chapel. Yes, okay. Now, ideally, everyone goes to the side chapel. Practically, it'll be Regis and whoever's hanging with them, probably. 
The idea is that we not focus only on the ministers going because the body has just received the body and blood of Jesus the Christ. We believe in real presence as Episcopalians. And so what we need to see is that we are, to focus on the elements would be to miss the point. The elements are moved to a sacred spot and then what happens? Anybody remember that? Do you remember the stripping of the altar? Now, at Holy Cross, it was always like a herd of locusts came in and it took everything. And it was like, whoa, baby. It doesn't need to be all that, but it should, the crosses should go, the linens should go, and it should be, um, it, it should be a reverent thing. So that the focus now is on your side chapel and it should be decorated beautifully where people may go and pray until midnight. Does that make sense? Do you, do you do that? Oh, you are? Interesting. Oh, interesting. Okay, so now after, which is, uh, this is very interesting. Okay, so after, let, let's, okay, so that's the end in a sense of Maundy Thursday. Do you have a picture of that? Now, look on page 276 for what's going on. Uh, and we, we talked about prefaces last week. Okay, now there's a ton of pages for Holy for Good Friday. Okay, what time is your service on Good Friday? Noon, 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 and, noon and seven. Okay, how long will it last? A half hour, forty-five minutes. That's all. Okay, yeah. All right. So when you look at what the prayer book suggests, and again, Egeria recorded, you will see that there are three parts to the Good Friday service. There's the liturgy of the word. Now look at, first of all, how do the ministers enter? Regis and whoever he's with, how do they enter? Quiet. Silent. Silent. And that's what our book says. On this day the ministers enter in silence and then they, everybody kneels for silent prayer. And then you start the opening colic. There's no music. It's just very solemn and somber. Now, the focus is on the passion and death of Jesus the Christ. But we're not, the point is not to be pretending Jesus died again. That's, that's not the focus. The tone is one of celebration, teammates. Because we have, we have post-resurrection awareness. We know what this means. And it's the Gospel of John that's read, the Passion. And unlike the, um, what do we call the other three? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptics, S-Y-N, similar optics, vision. What we're talking about here is the Gospel of John. Again, the most theologized of them all. And what he's talking about is the is, is a sense of exaltation. So if you're here, anybody coming on Friday? Good Friday. Yeah, okay. Listen for a sense of exaltation in that gospel. It is not just about death. Again, the liturgy of Good Friday, there's no Eucharist, no Mass at all. Then there's, are you going to do the veneration of the cross, do you know? You don't do that, okay. Because that's the three parts that are in our prayer book. The liturgy of the word, you see all these solemn collects. And then you have the veneration of the cross, and then you have communion. The communion, had the, the, the wafers and the wine, was consecrated at the Maundy Thursday service. It is not consecrated on Good Friday. Okay, so, because there's no way to do that. All that needs to be at Maundy Thursday. Okay, we're just, we'll wrap this up shortly. Okay, so, um, so I, I see again, I, not knowing how you do business, I, I don't know what your Good Friday is going to be. But notice the tone. It should not be just mournful, Jesus died again. 
No, the focus is always on the passion, death, resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Okay, now let's just take a quick peek at the great vigil of Easter. Um, what time is your vigil? Eight o'clock, okay, so it should be as darkness is coming and in the darkness, eight o'clock, we ain't so dark, but we're sort of dark. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the kindling of the fire, and usually it's a new fire with flint and all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes on windy days, rainy nights, uh, you light a match, but generally that's not the ideal thing. And so you have the Paschal candle um, uh, lit from this newly kindled fire, and that's when the, the resurrection is proclaimed, the light of Christ, and then it's placed in the stand, carried around, whatever. Uh, what is local custom, I don't know here. But ascend, and look at, just take a moment and look at all the, what's going on in the liturgy of the word. How many readings do you have? Do you know, Tim? I'm not sure. It's five. Five readings, okay. You can have seven, you can have three, whatever you choose. But the readings run through the whole salvation history. They start with Genesis most often, and they take you through to, um, as you see here, salvation, Isaiah 55, Ezekiel, the Psalm, all that. Okay, there's a renewal of the baptismal vows, and the Eucharist begins, and it's the most appropriate day for baptism in the church. Because you may recall for the last two weeks we talked about the Easter Vigil and that was the time preparing for the catechumens, the people who are going to join the church. Okay, now I know you want to get out of here. But I just, um, I just want to say thanks for um, letting me come and see you all these weeks. And um, you are wonderful. And what I would do is take a good look at this calendar because it tells you more than you ever wanted to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can go on the computer and look at it. You can do that. You can do that. Yeah. I I'm old, Dean. I like to see this. I like to have it. I like... I'm old. What can I tell you? Okay. So, I wish you all a happy Easter preceded by a blessed Holy Week. So, thank you. Thank you all.